Welcome to Shelf Life from the Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm Erin Donovan, an associate with the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thank you all for joining us. We're excited for our program today, Ecopoetics, Poetry in the Natural World, held at the end of National Poetry Month and not too long after Earth Day as well. A couple of notes before I hand the program over to our moderator. Please share your questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time with the closed captions tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope that you will. For details about how to buy them from a local bookseller or check out a copy from your library, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore the schedule of upcoming programs and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's moderator. Erica Hauser, author of How is Travel a Folded Form, is a writer from Central Virginia. She will publish a nonfiction book in 2024 about the relationship between humans and deer. Erica, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Erin, and um, thank you to our three poets and to everyone who's tuned in. Um, I'm very honored to have the chance to listen to each of these poets read and to um, afterwards dive into some conversation about poetry and landscape and how uh, whatever we think of as nature might inform the poetic process. Um, and as a writer who like our three panelists has a connection with the Virginia landscape in particular, I'm interested to see how this specific land might enter our conversation. However, um, having said that, of course, Virginia is not one landscape. It's not really one place. It was not conceived of in that way by the Monacans who dwelled on the land where I am sitting right now or the Powhatans or other indigenous groups. And uh, that concept of Virginia is not such a relevant idea if you're an ash tree, an emerald ash borer, a deer, a river, or a cloud. Uh, the concept of Virginia is made of language. And I like to think that if poets have an especially keen relationship to language, maybe we are especially well positioned to operate in those spaces between um, the physical world that encompasses us that we're part of on the one hand. And then on the other hand, the world of memory, science, mythology, um, all those mental language-based realms that humans create and sustain. Um, and for me, that in-between space is much more interesting than what we would traditionally refer to as nature writing. And so I think we'll be hearing all of these poets today tracking various elements of that zone, that middle zone of encounter and transformation. Um, so with that, I'll get ready to hand things over to Kathy Davis, the first of our poets today, um, whose new book and debut collection won the Cider Press Review Book Award. Um, it's called Passiflora which is the Latin name for passion flower. So again, that attention to both the flower itself and the name that we've given to it. Um, Kathy is a poet and nonfiction writer from Richmond who previously published a chapbook with Finishing Line Press called Holding for the Farrier, um, as well as pieces in many journals. She holds a BA and MBA from Vanderbilt and an MFA in creative writing from Virginia Commonwealth University. And in coming to know her work, I've appreciated, um, among other things, her attunement to very tiny encounters, like when a speaker of a poem is talking to a neighbor over a fence and, um, quote, a wasp for a moment gives us both something to wave at. Um, so Kathy, please take it away. Thank you, Erica. Um, I'd also like to thank the Virginia Festival of the Book for its Shelf Life, Life series and to say how honored I feel to be reading with Danielle and Catherine. Since this spring, I thought I'd head straight to the garden. Undone. 
forage leaves for courage, heart, but I harvest just the blossoms, layer them in plastic clamshells, squint, their blue sky in a box, the black anthers, a murder of crows, bones sometimes surface in the compost, a sheep skull over the greenhouse door. The farmer down the road never mucked his stalls, left ewes, lambs to rot where they fell. Garden, I thought when he died, took a shovel to the rich dark mix, hauled it and his abandoned collie home. The flower tastes like cucumber, watery, bland, pleasure mostly in the color. Each day, nosing the path back to the old man's, the collie sits at the end of her undone chain. The way, out of longing, duty, habit, I've worried my own dead. Time and worms and heat have worked the stench from the manure. My hands gentle, the dog cowers, still anticipating blows. This next poem was inspired by a quote from Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer's 1947 text, Dialectic of Enlightenment. And it seems so relevant to the crazy times we live in today. The quote in full reads, enlightenment understood in the widest sense as the advance of thought has always aimed at liberating human beings from fear and installing them as masters. Yet the holy enlightened earth is radiant with triumphant calamity. And the title of the poem comes from the original name of the three movements in Schumann's Fantasy in C Major. Ruins, trophies, palms. Go back inside, my neighbor calls. There's a wolf at the end of your drive. She hits the buttons on her alarm system. A man's voice, windows and doors secure. I stay where I am, listening. He's too big for my small hands, Schumann, his chords, but someone is playing a lilt, a leap, a land, the scream of a small rodent, the raspy cry of a jackrabbit, madness or a hair's breadth from it, fantasy in C major. There are no wolves here. The man across the way stuffed one for target practice. Up close, you can see the holes, the holy enlightened earth radiant with triumphant calamity. My neighbor watches from inside, carnivore incarnate wolves. Five falling stepwise notes, choirs of angels, demons, shade and nuance, a long drawn, wavering howl. This poem is a feminist reworking of the creation story. And hopefully next time you do your laundry, it will make you see your dryer lint in a new way. Eve. After the fall, the stone has fallen from the bee box, the hive is loose, the music started, and a child wearing glitter in her hair, a sprinkle of barrettes, sequins on her slippers, whirls in bright hands over head, abandoned. The gods had covered their ears to me and cried, enough. So much drudgery and drivel to suffer through alone. But then one day, my dryer lint was the palest lavender. I molded it with glue into a tiny man. Hand shaping hands, flesh sculpting flesh. We were somewhere between beautiful and ugly when he first drew breath. This is the title poem of the book, 3 a.m. Awake on the flip side, 
Streetlights block the stars. The moon's lost behind somebody's roof. Marking time, the ice maker, a car on the street, the whoosh of furnace on then off. A monk bending over a flower sees crucifixion, sacrifice, names it passion. Passive flora, Christ. A woman should have the right to choose her own fetters, black nylons and a whip. Wet them, she says on late night TV. The ropes, they'll shrink as they dry, bind even tighter and hear a gag. But he's gone, her young lover, disappeared off screen, her door left standing ajar, monster, his parting shot. It's a sign of winter, the setting of the Pleiades, passion flower extract in a glass, but a gentle remedy, the bottle says, to help with sleep. I swallow drop after bitter drop, not a hair stirs, the beast already nodding off. The title of this next poem relates to how the blossoming, all the blossoming and new growth this time of year can feel a bit painful if you're grieving. April and the affront of spring. Last month, Ellen shot at 22, a random campus act police assure that makes the evening news. Her dad until that moment, just a guy I knew at school who stole flowers from the park to woo my roommate. Pink clipped branches from the cherries that grew so close together, each tree's blossoms blended with the next. And today, Alan, the cause my son at college emails home an accidental overdose. The chancellor's note that follows full of measures they will take to ease the student's grief. It's not contagious, my son said earnestly at eight, leaning toward me from his chair, too small yet for his feet to reach the ground. His classmate, Alex, crumpling to the floor that day, heart stopped during jumping jacks, a fatal defect lurking hidden. But not contagious, his teachers reassured, this disaster could not spread from one child to the next. This was written one February a few years ago on a return to Chicago where I lived in the early 80s. Freeze, not mine, those teenage boys playing chicken on the tracks. And it's been decades since I lived two train stops south or Lake Michigan has frozen all the way across. The 204 just coming into view, stop, I want to say to them, but don't. Late winter and the water's startled blue is as lovely as it is concerning. I've no illusions of control. At night, those snowpack years, as I trudged back to my apartment, the lamp lit homes would offer up their dreams. And I could see through each cracked curtain what I wanted to believe. Now the moon's too often tangled in the trees and the lake has given up its seasons. The train has come and gone. The boys have tired of their game and I can go on about my errands. No one admitted fear, no child was lost. Our luck held firm, but touch me and I will break into unspoken prayers littering this icy walk. The title of this last poem comes from a line in Air Ammon's book length poem, Sphere. Girls, she falcons, be thin. Let us work ourselves asleep against you. Don't do it, the falconer says, 
when I confess the overwhelming urge to pet the bird, stroke its feathers. A virgin, my mother told me as a child, is someone no one's ever touched. And so the raptor, who never felt her mother's tender preening, views contact as attack, responds with beak and talon to even the gentlest caress. Strange angel of the muse, almost weightless on the glove, she will snap the songbirds back to satisfy her hunger, ranch flesh from bone, her fierce appetite harnessed to feed our own, her sharp-eyed intent, so different from the soft stirrings I felt as a girl, innocent and ignorant. The limp yellow carcass of a chick tossed skyward, the peregrine quick on the draw, the bait caught mid-fall in a storm of down. She mantles meat as a mother might shelter a child, merciless in its protection. I was never a virgin by my mother's definition. And as a youth thought chastity a curse, the falcon tethered to her perch, cloistered in her dark and isolated room. But now I've come to marvel at her stoops, her high speed strikes, the fury unleashed in her pursuit of prey, hail, Mary, full of grace, Artemis and Isis, Wings folded, blinded, quiet, she tilts an ear to the field's great reservoir of sky. Then hood removed, the jesses loosed, she slips the fist to rise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, <clears throat> next up, we're going to hear from Danielle Beezer Dubrasky, whose book, uh, Drift Migration, I think will bring to us um, a sense of contrast between the Appalachian bioregion where Danielle is from originally, um, and where many of us are sitting right now, and um, then a very different landscape in the West where she lives now. Uh, she teaches at Southern Utah University, holds an MA from Stanford, and earned her PhD in creative writing from the University of Utah. Her chapbook, Ruin and Light, was the winner of the 2014 Anabiosis Press chapbook competition. Um, <clears throat> and I think in her work, we're going to um, have the treat of hearing a lot of mythical strains, magic and dream time um, and memory time um, as when, uh, this is a line I loved from her book, the Narcissus opens like a dove to the center of a sand dollar. Um, so Danielle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. And thank you also to the Virginia Festival of the Book for inviting me to be part of uh, Shelf Life. I so appreciate that. And I'm honored again to read with Kathy and with Catherine. So I'm going to start with a short poem. When we think about eco-poetics, one of the concepts I consider is the, actually, the idea of nature thriving despite uh, adverse conditions. And so this is a very different landscape. This poem is called Sepulveda Basin Refuge, and it takes place um, at a bird migratory refuge in Los Angeles. They congregate along the lake's shoreline, snowy egrets, coots, and grebes, used to the noise from the large loud birds out of LAX that manage to fly so high. A leaf blower scatters dry sycamore leaves along the footpath, roaring over the only sign of winter in Los Angeles, and someone's model airplane whines in the air. Beer cans, bottles, plastic bags jam, jam a creek below the asphalt trail. Scraps of white paper crumple like tiny cranes in the mud. A blue heron finds a rivulet, rests her leg. So the, as was mentioned, there are, uh, this, this book has references to myths. So I'm going to read just two poems from a section called Eurydice's Mirror. The you in this section is addressed to Orpheus and the she is, is uh, Eurydice. 
And the, this starts with a, a sense of their connection in terms of that relationship. Your treasures are marbles, matchbox cars, old maps, fly fishing lures you find in the reeds. Hers are shells, antler shards, acorns, a tip of a raccoon's tail found in mulched leaves. You give her what you value most, a mayfly nymph broken off someone else's line. She puts it with an antler bit and they are two fragments rattling together, one snapped off, one shed. Somewhere the fisherman has unsnagged his pole and the buck has, has grown back its rack. When he startles the stag in a clearing, he is stunned by its frame. When it lurches into the woods, he looks for a hint of pelt, weaves it into lures. And this is a poem that anticipates their um, departure. She speaks on, their, on your last morning as though stealing someone else's time, saying how you both love trains, windows framing backyards of clotheslines, gardens, tool sheds, alfalfa fields, and mill shooting steam into the summer air. Neither of you knows as the window changes scene that the train is speeding faster, the cars behind you unbuckling at each town until yours is the only car moving and you are the only ones left. Trees in the backyards change color. Fields become fallow, the grist mill shuts down, and the sky turns white with winter constellations. So because this poem was mentioned by Erica, I'll go ahead and read the first poem of the next section, which is about the Persephone myth. The section is called Blood Red Seeds, and this is the first poem from that section. Night the trees trill at the edge of my ear, a seven year sleep unraveling from husk honey to bark. There was a night like this, leaves slowly falling, a year opening into rings and rings. We skip stones across them, across the maple's reflection, its fallen crown, a ghost of leaves. I took you into the waterfall where we drowned. The narcissus opens like a dove to the center of a sand dollar. I reach for winged petals on the edge of flight. The last note I hear is the sea's echo sounding the shell of my ear, your cry. My first gift in a strange place, six blue china horses, a wilderness in their eyes. He holds them in his hands as if holding the sea. Take them, he says. I touch their cool hooves. Now you must always return. I smash the horses into blue foam, deeper into the earth, I carry the sea with me. So those sections pertain to aspects of myth, but the final section of the book is called Vespers in the Great Basin. And it is the one in which, um, as was mentioned, I live in the, in the south, southern Utah, but um, was, grew up in Virginia. Those first poems were very much influenced by the Virginia landscape. But this section here, I'm going to read without a lot of introduction or ex explanation between poems um, to give you a sense of that, of that layering of landscape that happened for me in terms of memory and also um, having a new landscape unfold before me, two very different landscapes from each other, the Southern and the Southwest. Retrieval. Air in the empty chambers of the Ammonite gives it buoyancy for swimming until it settles in sediment as the Kaibab Sea shrinks from the Great Basin that is so deep, its rocks and shells will never reach the ocean. The ocean will have to come to them pouring over the rim when the West Coast sinks into depths that flood the Mojave. In another epic, creatures in limestone will taste this new salt, abrading their locked beds, a trail toward home. So the Great Basin is the remnants of an ancient sea um, from this area. So this poem is called Daedalus Bookshop, and it is my homage to childhood memories of wandering through Daedalus, the Daedalus Bookshop um, in downtown Charlottesville, but also about the concept of memory itself. Scrolls of feathers hold a sun painted on the wooden sign at the shop's door of Fourth and Main that opened when I was a child to hardbound copies of The Little Princess and Bambi. In high school, I followed musty books through each room, shelves circling tighter around those hours held in the place where memory curls in the folds of the brain shaped like a ram's horn, named after the Egyptian god Amun, the hidden one. There at 15, I found James Agee's collected poems, 
Borges imagined the Minotaur hunting him through a labyrinth, lines he shaped into an architecture of his wandering. He heard its voice bellow from the depths in the horns of Ammon, or was it the horns calling him back from the hunt? The ancient architect flew to another land, rarely recalled the sun he lost to the sea, as A.G. did on page five, when I first read August, 1978, little child take no fright in that shadow where you are. When I paid the $2 and stepped out from the dark corridors into the sun. And this poem again is influenced by the Virginia landscape um, and memory, the idea of losing a sibling, but having that sibling return in the natural world. Proteus cabinet, and that refers to the box that magicians use when during the disappearing act. Proteus cabinet. Two children slosh muddy keds in water, unearth salamanders that burrow webbed toes and silt. The boy will leave behind his smile and branches when their mother calls them for supper, baking bread, forgetting the salt. They watch fireflies blink in the wink in the backyard in the backyard woods, a bottle of light snuffed out by morning. It was not as though the sister turned away and her brother was gone through the wardrobe. But that morning, the salamander spread its toes deep and would not come out. There was no salamander, only a creek and a brother. Open the window to let in the sky. He will still be there when you go looking. So this poem, this next one is called Leaving Virginia. And the next few poems are the ones that weave that landscape of Virginia landscape in the Southwest. Utah houses soften their angles at dusk. Hollyhocks blend with the larkspur. Women disappear behind graciousness, a smile that tells nothing. Their shadows stretch in the twilight that darkens a kitchen window. They sweep out corners holding the wand of a broom. Sand skims a patio beneath a mirage of white dogwood petals. I seem on the edge of everything. The Mojave spread out west beyond the grid streets of a Mormon town. My first night in the desert, stars I had only glimpsed through a humid gaze, now glitter bright as ice. And this one is called Great Basin. I am no nearer to what the sea tries to loosen wedged in rock, a sorrow slipped between a trapped metal cap and glass shattered along another coast. The truth is, I don't live near the ocean, but in a desert town I refuse to see, built on an alluvial fan of gypsum soil, shifting beneath cracked plaster and skewed door frames, beneath miles of silver sage, rabbit brush, dry lakes, and wind trembling through pinion rooted along the highway that stretches through Paiute land. I leave my own trace, planting wisteria, honeysuckle, southern foreigners thirsting for water, I blink, and the town is gone, drowned in a sea of fossils. What that sea left behind is the desert I walk through, a sorrow slipped between trilobites and shale. And this poem is one that describes again that, that Southwest landscape and, the, and myth um, as they begin to become more emerged in that landscape. It's called Winter Solstice in the Gorge. Our myths turn long nights into cut evergreen, sold on grocery store parking lots, a continent away from reindeer starving as the Arctic ice dissolves. Only one star guides the way for diesels lit like Christmas, miles of commerce that thread the Mojave. The longest night spills from a cup of tears I drink through this highway that weaves between monoliths of an American Stonehenge along the Virgin Rivers winding course. At the hour's cusp, I see her face in the rock, Freya, who carries the sun in antlers. She spins a wheel around our breath, seeds the earth with bits of amber. At dawn, the sun stands still on a plateau of kaibab sediment, reaches its rays down gypsum layers, touches sandstone near bighorn sheep who step out of shadow. Then these last uh, four poems, um, again, pertain to that concept of uh, <clears throat> the past coming into the present. And this one's called Old Haunts. 
Cicadas trill outside my open window, but it's only crickets rubbing their legs in the Utah night. Their song tricks me back down the path across the stream to McIntyre Park, where high school friends take their children on the 4th of July, red, copper, blue fireworks flash with a boom, then whistle into sulfur and ash as small hands wave sparklers over blankets and magnesium burns slowly above a child's wrist into empty KFC buckets. I stand at the cul-de-sac of my old house where the blue spruce stretches its shadow over the groove my, board, my bike wore in the grass and watch new owners set a dining room table, then switch on lamps to play a record that spins vibrato through the walls before I fall back to sleep this side of the continental divide. And uh, this poem is called Vespers in the Great Basin. Bald eagles gather among the elms with soft whistles as they glide over snowfields of thistle and jackrabbits, settle on branches, umber wings folded against their bodies, albino heads tucked from the wind. Each winter, we watch them fly across the valley to this empty ranch, stretch their wingspan beyond six feet, their darkness growing in sunset until Venus appears in the west. Driving home, your right hand fumbles with my fingers as if with a rosary, while your left keeps the wheel in check. Out the window, I see a brown quarter horse lean against a fence in snow, haunches turned to the wind. Our silence meets the coldness that blows in through door jams, the chimney. Next January, when mountain peaks glisten beneath the miters of ice, we'll return to the elms as eagles gather across the river and the ribbon valley. They'll hunch together on racked branches of winter trees, still believing they can keep the cold at bay. My last two poems um, are metamorphic and even song. And metamorphic refers to the layering of, of us, a rock in the, uh, in, the, in the landscape of the Southwest. Wind still blows across the desert with lightning and hail, crushing delphinium, hyacinths, flowers not native to the West. Their blooms too bright for the muted striations that flank the town. But morning light sets fire to red cliffs on the East Hills where time is compressed into a gray stripe of marine traces. Triassic, the oldest layer of the shoreline parallels Main Street. Perhaps it is too much to carry two places at once. The weight of the home left behind presses against the walls of this one as if the Appalachians hiding stories of their age beneath oaks, mossy stones, thickets wild with ferns, could shear the red rock cliffs of legends until their layers disintegrate into a basin of salt from the dogwood blossoms, hard green tears. Sorry, I'm gonna get some water. So the last line was, until their layers disintegrate into a basin of salt from the dogwood blossoms, hard green tears. So this final poem is even song, <clears throat> and it's one again where the landscape begins to be a part of my life. Sunbeams scatter through oxygen and nitrogen, bending, frequ bending frequencies into a band of blue, gray, and white, swallowed by waves of nautical twilight. The moment Venus appears next to Algo, the demon star, and Lambda. <clears throat> Astral boat lights floating on the January horizon. I fly over arteries of lights in a Brasilia, tilt to one side along the buckhorn flats. Home is scattered, red cliffs to the east, a dry basin to the west, and in between, a town of three exits where I have lived out the same day for 30 years. A glossy magazine promises vacations to Denmark, Bali, Alaska, where oceans beat the shores with breakers from our first breaths before our lidless eyes could no longer see through water. At a wind gap, symbols on rock carved by Fremont Indians tell of the equinox. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> tell of the equinox, rain, a journey, a woman giving birth. Cirrus clouds over the Pine Valley Range must mean thunderheads building in Nevada. 
they should reach us by tomorrow night. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Danielle, that was wonderful. Um, finally, let's welcome our um, last reader, Catherine Hankla, who has recently published her 10th poetry collection, which is called Not Xanadu. Um, it joins her four books of fiction and a memoir in essays. She is a um, Hollins University Professor Emerita of English and Creative Writing. She serves as poetry editor of the Hollins Critic, and she also um, is a visual artist and exhibits her work at Market Gallery in Roanoke, Virginia. She's a native Appalachian, and um, I was tickled to realize she's a runner, which is a way of being in place that uh, certainly informs her work as when she describes running past train cars, uh, quote, loaded with deep pit coal that glitters like negative stars. So Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Erica, for the introduction and really enjoyed hearing the poets before me, Danielle and Kathy. I look forward to reading your books and uh, it's an honor to read with you today. I'm gonna uh, start out with a couple of poems that operate at the intersection of art making and ecology. This poem is titled, To Make a Collage. Lifted from context and pasted, nothing will be recognizable as either invasive or native. Colors and shapes align or overlap, alternating large and small, jagged and smooth with rich intensity to juxtapose poor blurry hints of flower or flesh. This bit of iridescence paired by an exacto blade, a flash of indigo bunting abuts the plum snippet from a model's cashmere cloak. Beside green blueberries lost in their immature bush, a bluebird excised from his field struggles across space, swims against the skyscraper's repetitious mirrors, the suggestion of a glacier. As Erica mentioned, I um, am a runner. I mostly run along the Greenway in um, Roanoke. And one of the things you notice along the Greenway, which is also along the river, are some historical plaques and other bits of information that the Greenway folks put up. And one of the things informs us, one of these markers informs us that the Roanoke log perch, which is a little fish with a lot of fins, is um, nearing extinction. So I wrote this poem just entitled The Name of the Fish about um, trying to paint a Roanoke log perch. King of the darters, your small body spans no more than the length of my hand. Dancing fins splay along your spine, fanning coyly. Fancy feathered headdresses undulate as you, insectivorous, shift clear waters, nosing gravels. Narrow body tinted green, rimmed red at times and slashed with generous tiger darkness. Someone transposed you into a public tank where you sloshed until perishing. Painting your lightning body, I reach for yellow to distinguish you from splashes 
startling your habitat. The next uh, couple of points I'm going to read are um, from kind of a mini series within this book of, of runner poems. This one's entitled Runner Crows. Three strays guard the sidewalk space like sphinxes as I huff. Nothing more startling than a paw might extend, but that is doubtful. A black man pulling his patched sedan up to the curb catches my eye for the nod. Painters check and climb ladders, carrying their first buckets to the eaves. Driving a red scooter, a young pale woman swerves me on the narrow bridge. Below the bridge, five lanes of coal cars wait to sparkle as the sun ascends. Above the bridge, sentinel crows purchase the lamppost, calling a warning or blessing. This next one is uh, entitled Runner Sweating. I guess all of the runner poems could be entitled Runner Sweating. So here we have it, Runner Sweating, part one. Trucks from both directions blocking. I dodge up and back before crossing to the wrong side. Two. To the boy in blonde dreads on the porch, half hidden, I say, good morning. Good morning, he says, I like your shoes. Three, the old gray tabby with runny eyes has not yet budged. Neither frost, rain, nor my trudging doth disturb the fur bunch. Four. On the bridge, white woman with buttocks of a bull, ears sink to sounds I cannot hear. Solemn Asian dad lurching ahead, mom behind him, sunny, daughter, wrinkle browed. Five, brown man in bright blue headphones paused at the gas pumps speaking into his mic something about the way you smiled at him or the way he looked at you six running running i measure lopes to a mere three miles my sweat linking dissimilarities my only fluidity equal Humidity, humility maintains pleasure in equalities. Here's a, a poem entitled Psalm Birds that borrows a couple of lines from Psalm 102 to start each section of the poem. In each uh, section of the poem, you'll notice that I'm uh, speaking from a bird, as a bird, from a bird, psalm birds, one. Like a bird alone on a housetop, I sing of the flooded valley, beseeching my best love, with winter coming on, two yellow birds, small as ornaments on my palm, swift hearts like mine, stinging with power. Our Fraser furs held songbirds frozen in silver glass. I clipped them on branches as if the solstice tree were still alive on an Appalachian mountainside as if mountains were abiding. Two, like an owl among the ruins, 
from the roof of a downtown building, not the limestone outcrop that once was home. I surveyed the center of the alley. I caught my fill swooping while others slept. In daylight, I kept to my perch. Then came a man to roost. Rifles discharged rounds, scattering flocks that never bothered me, but shot on cars as city starlings must. I flew for a day and a night and never found my cliffs. I flew above the frothing sea, above me, trails of plasma sparked. I'm going to read a little short poem um, called My Treasure. My feet find uneven ground shaved to the dust by the blade, complete and bearable my ache, heart balanced on the scale. My life, the broken egg and the living bird, a blue jay feather is my treasure. This next poem called Tree Frogs is a series of haiku until the last line breaks that um, pattern. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Tree Frogs. Night swimmers check pool skimmers into which speckled frogs have sucked bunched up green packages of live matter without trumpets. We stand by for jumps. One ancient bullfrog, front leg pinned by salt water and dissolving, waits for rescue. We can't save anything from ourselves, not even barking tree frogs. All our frogs are barking frogs, our needs, our own. Don't make me leave this one world. Please don't. I think I'll um, maybe close out with the title poem to leave us a, a little time for discussion today. not Xanadu. This, um, the title of the book and thus the, the titular poem, not Xanadu, um, came from Kubla Khan, which is a poem by Coleridge. And it starts, um, in Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. It goes on from there. So um, playing uh, with the negation of that Xanadu mentioned in the poem, not Xanadu. Tulip poplar turning leaves over in the breeze, translucent mitts that know what it means to grow when no one is looking. Obstensively, every leaf is the beginner, but that is enough to start the bubbling that will blossom and surround these leaves with color when the season breaks. Azure means the blue of sky, an enormous idea patched through. Forget me not, blue water, blue breath, blue bells along roadsides, dogs rolling in blue mysteries. So no, this is not Xanadu, but here there is the blue. Thank you. <clears> Thank <throat>
Okay, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, what a treat to hear all three of these poets work in your own voices. Um, so that brings us to the Q&A portion of our gathering. Um, and folks who have tuned in, um, you are very welcome to type questions into the Q&A and we'll see what we can get to in the time we have left. Um, so I wanted to start by um, kind of poking and prodding a little bit at that umbrella term eco-poetics under which we're gathered here. Um, and just ask each of our poets to reflect on that term, that category a little bit and how it does or does not apply to your own poetic practice. Um, you know, is that idea of Ecopoetics, something you think about when you're writing or after you've written? Um, and what do you think about that term as perhaps an update to the more traditional notion of nature writing? Um, so, uh, Kathy, would you like to address that? Um, well, I think in terms of, of my own work, uh, a lot of the poems in Passiflora were. Uh, written during a time where I was grieving um, a loss of several family members and friends and some beloved pets. And, and so for me, it's natural to turn to nature for solace. But I, but I also think poems that come from grieving also um, connect um, with the environment because I think we're also grieving what we're losing in our environment and what's threatened. And I think this is very evident in the poem um, Freeze where uh, here you've seen, the, the speaker has seen what uh, Lake Michigan used to look like in the winter and then decades later sees what global warming has done to it. So there's that sense of loss. Um, but there's also uh, it, in, nature gives you that sense that everything is temporary, um, but also there's beauty to it. So I think, um, and the sense also that you have, you have very little control in many ways over what happens. Um, you can do small things um, that in your own little world, like you can take the sheep, sheep's uh, manure and, and make a garden out of it, but you can't you can't cure the damage that's been done to the dog, just like you can't cure what's happened to Lake Michigan, so. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, someone has typed in a question here that I think you just started to answer, but I'll, I'll put it to the other two of you um, as well. Um, how do you balance eco grief with appreciation, um, uh, you know, as relates to moving through climate crisis and other, things that are happening now. Do you want to address, this is getting to be a lot, Danielle, but <laughs> do you want to address this topic of eco-poetics? Yeah, I'd love to. And I'm going to pick up what Kathy was mentioning about grief, because for me, leaving Virginia was truly a mourning process because of a death in the family, circumstances changed, we had to sell our house. And so the landscape for Utah was, was not a choice to end up there. Um, so that idea of grief, but also a sense of place, I think is, is, is strongly connected for me in terms of eco-poetry, that it's a way to preserve, connect to, and, um, you know, con I guess, create that connection for a place. In terms of um, how that notion fits in with what's occur occurring now, I think part of it, there's, there's me, uh, one way I think about it is poetry as witness, as in what you know, as an eco if you're writing eco poetics, you are describing the things that are happening as they're happening, perhaps as a way to preserve or conserve, to to um, to educate, but also to um, to create that image that that is lasting. Um, so that's that's one way that I would I would consider it. And in terms of that concept of grief, another aspect of poetry for me, in terms of eco poetry, is the idea of a healing image. So that there may be something that I that um that I feel is powerful for me. For me, the dogwood blossom showing up in various images of the West was my way of, of keeping that connection to the South and bringing it into the West. Um, and I think unless you've lived in Virginia, it's hard to understand how iconic that image can be. Mm -hmm. Bringing it with you. So that, that's how I would look at that. 
Yes, and maybe some of us who are in Virginia can see them outside our windows as we speak. Um, we're in that season right now. Um, what, what do you think, Catherine? Uh, we've heard about, you know, ideas of witness, solace, grieving. There's a lot there. Yeah, I think I, I think we're well past the um, nature poetry um, mode as some kind of pure appreciation because um, we've all talked about the elegaic mode with uh, respect to the natural world. And so there is echo po poetics as I understand it is more about the intersection of um, human culture and the natural world. So we're, we're talking more about ecology and sustainability and also the Anthropocene, mean, meaning the human impact era that we're in. So we can't really roll it back to, to when humans had a smaller footprint on the earth. Um, so we have to take it where we are and move forward. And yet I think uh, I know I, as a child, and I'm hearing that echo in, in uh, Kathy's work and Danielle's experience, the balm of the natural world and a kind of encounter with nature that felt uh, like I was just another creature on the earth. And I wanted to uh, just encounter it that way. I didn't really understand the full impact of my species <laughs> at that point. So there is this kind of lovely purity that, that happens uh, in childhood encounter with nature that you carry with you if you experience that. And I think there's always a kind of wistfulness left in us so that we want to elevate those experiences. And I know I find ways to elevate creatures in my work. I, um, flora and fauna, around me there's still um i know some echo poetry is really made beyond description but i i think description is important because it does give people who don't live in your um, particular landscape access to your work and, um, as poets we do like to name things <laughs> describe things we're we're very much about nouns so um I do, I do like to find ways to specify place, but also describe it in ways that create an, um, a way that somebody else can come to it. So mm -hmm. I guess there's a lot of balance in all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think your, your answer just got at another question that had come in about, um, it says, when you are writing about place, how do you, if you do, balance writing for people who might call that place home versus writing for someone who has never been to that place? And I think, you know, that idea of starting with description might be might be part of that. Um, and then, as you say, moving beyond that and investigating those those other relationships or the deep time. You know, yes, one thing I want to throw in there about that question is that I think it's really important to have your poems read by people who are a, a diverse group of people. And I, and I mean, people who don't recognize everything you're saying as home to them, because mm -hmm. they ask, they tend to ask questions that you wouldn't have thought of. And, and it's mm -hmm. really good to have that nudge input on your work I think so, so you know things that you may think are self-explanatory are not mm -hmm. absolutely um well we're a little short on time so I think I'm going to go to our final kind of lightning round question which is um I had asked each of our readers to um maybe recommend something to us that they've recently read or watched or listened to that might be uh, relevant to our discussion or just interesting, generative for whatever reason. So I'm interested to hear what they've come up with. Kathy, do you wanna go first on that one? 
Um, I think a, a nonfiction book I read um, not too long ago was Bicycling with Butterflies by Sarah uh, Dykeman, I think you pronounce it. Um, and what she does is she cycles, bicycles the whole route of the monarch butterflies migration up to from Mexico up to the Northeast and then back. And uh, watching her, reading about how she does that, how strenuous it is. And it's just really inspiring to think about what the monarch butterflies do. So, mm -hmm. Well, maybe we'll read it in the fall when we can <laughs> see them flying overhead as, as we read, look up from the book. Danielle? Yeah, I'll just mention that if, if it's uh, just a couple of books, Sherwin Bitsui, a collection called Dissolve. Um, it's a long poem about a river and it's beautiful, beautiful uh, sequence of poetry. He's a Navajo writer now teaching at Northern Arizona University. And then Nancy Takis, a book called Dearest Water, which is also very pertinent about landscape, but uh, eco poetry and conservation, climate crisis, um, all of those. So those are two, two books that I've been reading that I've um, been, been intrigued by. Great, thank you. And Catherine, what do you have for us? Uh, I just throw a monkey wrench in here and uh, recommend a podcast that I just oh, heard from uh, Radio Lab, and the title was "Life in a Barrel," and it's fascinating. It's about rethinking natural selection and the fossil record. Great, wonderful. Well, um, very happy to have all those. Uh, dispatches from y'all's uh, cultural intake. And um, it's time for us to wrap things up. This has been just so enjoyable. Thank you all so much for reading, Kathy, Danielle, and Catherine, um, and to the organizers of this event, and of course, to everybody who tuned in. Um, please do consider buying um, the three new books from these poets from your local bookseller or through the links that are on babook.org. Um, you can also check out future virtual events and watch past events from the Virginia Festival of the Book at uh, that same site, babook.org. Um, thanks again to everybody and very, very happy late spring. Thank you. Thank you.